Welcome everybody to the second of our fall Saturday Speaker Series 2023. Um, we have with us today Redmond Poet Laureate Laura Day and she is going to be speaking to us about, and this is a long topic title, Currents of Time and Place, Poetry that Engages with History and Image in Cascadia. I'm Laura Lee Bennett. I'm the Vice President of the Society and Program Chair. Uh, unfortunately, John Afterbro, our fearless leader and president, won't be with us today, but he'll be here in November. Um, first, we'd like to know, how did you hear about this program? Uh, newsletter? Raise your hand. Okay. Social media? Anybody? <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. Um, word of mouth. Okay. How many of you have heard of the Redmond Laureate Program? All right. All right. Well, we're going to learn more today. Um, we will have a Q&A after today's presentation, so please hold your questions to the end of the program. And before we introduce our speaker, a few other things to say. Thank you to Victor's Celtic Coffee and Roasters for our coffee today. Give them a hand. Woo. Thank you to Mary Sullivan and Cynthia Olson for bringing the homemade treats. Yay. And Joanne Potter, our volunteer coordinator, and our team of volunteers for putting this together today. We would be lost without you. Thank you. Our upcoming speaker programs, we actually have a couple more things going on this fall, if you can believe that. Uh, this coming Wednesday at the Redmond Library, our evening speaker series, we're going to host with the library, Friends of the Redmond Library, um, Mohai historian and author Lorraine McConaughey. She's going to be running a workshop on how to be your own historian. Uh, search techniques and that sort of thing. Um, there's flyers in the office if you want to take one and we also have posted the event online on Facebook and our website. You need to register and there's a link to do that. But there's about 13 seats left so if you want to check that out feel free to do it. 
um, in November, on the, the November 11th, we will have our final speaker program for the fall. Eric Wagner from Humanities Washington will give a talk about Mount St. Helens 40 years later, after the blast. It's also my birthday, so I, if somebody wants to, you know, bring a cake, that would be that would be way cool. Um, save the date for our ice cream social and membership meeting coming up in January. I'm just putting that in your brains now, so you'll find out more later because it's still early. But we're going to have it this year again at the Happy Valley Grange on Saturday, January 13th. Uh, Oh, and one last remark here before I hand things over to our lovely and talented Holly Turner. If you wanted to uh, join the society today or renew your membership, please talk to Holly after the program and she'll take care of things for you. And with that, I introduce Holly Turner. Take it away. Alrighty, thank you, Laura Lee. Um, before we begin today's presentation, we would like to acknowledge that we're on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples who continue to steward these lands and waters as they have since time immemorial. We recognize Washington's tribal and indigenous or native organizations, which actively create, shape, and contribute to our thriving communities. The Redmond Historical Society is committed to doing our part to engage with and amplify the voices of Native peoples and tribes. And now to introduce our speaker, Laura Day is a poet and teacher, a lifetime resident of the Pacific Northwest. Day studied creative writing at the University of Washington and the Institute of American Indian Arts. Day is Eastern Shawnee. She is a recipient of the Native American Arts and Cultures Fellowship and Artist Trust Fellowship and fellowships from the Hugo House and the Jack Straw Writers Program. Day is the current Poet Laureate of Redmond. Her first book, Tributaries, won the 2016 American Book Award. Her latest book, Instruments of the True Measure, won the Washington State Book Award. Recently, Day was named one of 23 recipients of a nation nationwide to be rewarded a fellowship from the Academy of American Poet Laureates. This award grants each recipient $50,000 and is given to honor poets of literary merit who are appointed to serve in civic positions. This award aims to support poets in their continued creation of meaningful, impactful, and innovative projects that engage their fellow residents, including youth, with poetry. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Laura, and you can clap or snap if you're into that. <laughs> um, so welcome, Laura. Take two. My name is Laura Day. Um, so nice to uh, see everyone. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning here. Um, this is such a warm and welcoming place with so much wonderful information. So it feels so nice to come into a space with so many things to learn. And um, so lots of gratitude from my part to being so warmly welcomed into this space. And um, one of the first things I'd like to do is um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself in my indigenous language. Um, from my bio, um, one thing that may come up is that I am a, I'm a Native American person. Um, I'm actually from the Eastern Shawnee tribe, so my tribal community is in the state of Oklahoma. And I am a speaker of my tribal language um, and was educated in tribal schools. So the way that I would greet you, can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm pretty close, so I'll try a little, maybe I'll try to project a little more into the mic as well. Um, so the way that I would greet you is Hoesi um, Gagasi um, indicates that we're spending time in the day. Hoka Hoesi Lasi Mamopue is our greeting phrase, and it means um, how are we breathing? Uh, that's how we ask how things are, is we ask, how are we breathing? And then I say, Laura Day Nitesito, so on Watue Neli, and that means my name's Laura Day, and I am a Shawnee person. I grew up pretty near here in the Snoqualmie Valley, um, and when I was young, I grew up on a farm. Um, specifically, we uh, raised quarter horses. So I was reminiscing about when I was a young person, um, all of us kids in 4-H would come here to downtown Redmond, and there used to be a Western store, um, right kind of in downtown. And this is uh, every summer in June, we were getting ready for the King County Fair in Enumclaw, and um, that's where we would all get our boots and hats. So I have such warm recollections. 
of Redmond from my youth, and of course, um, being the poet laureate has given me the opportunity to learn more about how beautiful, thriving, and dynamic the community of Redmond is today. So I want to share some information um, for folks about how to use the ecosystem and land and history of Redmond to inspire writing and observation. But I'd also love to spend some time talking about the laureateship itself, so how important and significant it is that the city of Redmond has a poet laureateship that brings poetry and poets into the community, how special it is for us in the writing community but also I think how wonderful it is for the city itself. So the first thing that I wanted to share is our current installation. So I'm actually the outgoing poet laureate. Very soon um, your city will get to greet a new poet laureate who will serve a two-year term and bring their own vision and background into the space and um, try to offer dynamic opportunities for the folks of Redmond and the folks who commute into Redmond as well to experience writing and to notice how unique the community is. My time as Poet Laureate was deeply focused on Redmond history and ecosystem. Uh, so the very first thing I did when I thought about applying for this position was I spent a few days walking the length of the Sammamish River. So, um, which wonderfully is very easy to do. Um, that's one of my favorite things about Redmond is how beautifully walkable it is. Um, so I started in what's now Kenmore, the mouth of the river into Lake Washington, made my way all the way through the path, took me about three solid Saturdays to, <laughs> to kind of take it in pieces. And I felt like it was uh, one of the best ways that I could perceive the community and its movement through time. And of course, um, as your museum does so beautifully illustrate, it's a profoundly altered river, um, very different to what it what maybe once was, but I think it's still one of the most beautiful routes and entryways into what Redmond is, um, and it's very unique and important history and ecosystem. So all of that led me to, as my final project in the laureateship, um, focus on the ecosystem of the Sammamish River and Lake Sammamish. And I was able to learn so many things about the history of this place and also how important and distinct the ecosystem is. So the image that I'm showing you right now um, is at Idlewood Park, um, which is a park that hopefully folks have visited and know um, that is right on Lake Sammamish. And this is an installation that we created quite recently. So we just did this, I think, just over a week ago. And I worked together with many partners in the city. So one of the most wonderful connections I have been able to make is with folks in parks um, and also folks in the forestry and the creeks and streams division. We've had rich, rich discussions. Um, I've been so honored to be taken to see some of the pre-contact growth um, that still exists in small patches. So I would credit a lot of the connection to place um, with really learning from the people who are serving and stewarding. I also had deep connections with the Snoqualmie tribe. So my final project focuses on the kokanee salmon, um, a landlocked salmon from the area all around Lake Sammamish um, as part of its kind of core, uh, the cornerstone of the ecosystem that I think about and encourage folks to write about. So what you see is this projection, and it is at Idlewood Park. Um, the projection itself was made in collaboration with some wonderful young folks in Redmond. So we worked with um, teens coming from Redmond who have this incredible technical capacity. And what you see here is something called project mapping. 
So um, these young folks worked with um, teachers to create um, programming that allowed them to project map, which means that they projected words and images, and they were able to show the words and images against this building. Um, if you saw it in person, it's incredibly dynamic because they were also able to wrap images around the pillars and on the lawn itself, they were able to show the movement of kokanee salmon as a video. So I thought this was a great introduction because one of the things that I learned from the community here is that we have a beautiful amalgamation of history and contemporary technical knowledge. So the purpose of this projection was to embrace the way that we're in a space of migration, we're in a space of ecosystem, and we can use, and particularly in this case, young folks can show us how to use technology to illustrate how the migration and patterns of ecosystem might appear. So I thought of this as a kind of iconic Redmond experience that both embraced the land itself and also the tradition of technical innovation that has come to be fairly synonymous with this city across the world. I'd love to encourage folks to, um, if you're able to go to the site, um, there is an installation. So on the sidewalks um, at Idlewood Park, there's a poetry walk. And if you take a journal, you can create this sort of choose your own adventure by picking different elements of the ecosystem that are aligned to different poetry prompts. And I'd love to encourage that. I'll talk about it a little bit more at the end to an off for some resources to guide that. So this laureateship has been really delightful. Um, I've learned so much from the community. As I said, um, growing up more or less adjacent to this community in an agricultural setting, it allowed me to embrace how much it's changed and use writing to reflect on how incredibly dynamic all of the traditions are here. Um, one of the things I got to learn when I was participating in some of the welcoming week activities was how linguistically dynamic and diverse um, Redmond is. So we had some wonderful opportunities to have folks be able to write in multiple languages and I was astounded at the number of languages spoken um, and how incredibly powerful that diversity of linguistic background is as a poet um, was really incredible to see. So there were some core intentions that I brought to my time at as, as the Poet Laureate. And this is one of the reasons that I believe the city of Redmond's laureateship is so powerful. It's a big enough project that you can really kind of envision and achieve a kind of dream as a poet. And it's small and nimble enough that each poet can bring their own sensibilities, background, and purpose into the laureateship. So I thought it was the perfect way to have a community benefit from all of these different visions of what literacy and poetry can do. And I will tell you, you know, the literary community is small. Um, so I got to talk to all of the former laureates. And each of us, I think, brought our own distinct perspective into the position. And what that means is over the course of, well, let's say mm, 15 years, <laughs> Redmond's had the chance to benefit from so many diverse perspectives and ways. So some laureates have focused really on readings. Um, some laureates have focused on publication. I know that I came in with the intention to focus on the land um, and to get folks writing about place. So sometimes we call that eco-poetics. And this position allowed me to absolutely delve into that hope and it allowed me to really learn from the land itself. So some of the core intentions um, that I brought to this position are I really wanted to build curiosity and affinity for reading and writing poetry. And I found that our local library system was incredibly helpful. So um, if anyone gets the chance to kind of peruse the City of Redmond's Poet Laureateship page, um, you can see all these projects, you can participate in them. And for all of them, um, I've worked with the King 
County Library System to create a reading list. So each project has a reading list full of resources that you can collect from the local library branch um, to go even deeper into the concepts. I would add a lot of them actually connect really closely to the artifacts and information right here. So some of these prompts, I think, you could actually really benefit from using these resources and these historical artifacts to spur writing as well. My desire is always to center place as the primary conceptual foundation for the learning and writing that I offered. And this was, I think, the most revelatory or the most exciting part because sometimes when I discussed with folks um, who come from outside the city and commute into work here, they would say, you know, I never really have time to notice the land itself. I come in, um, the traffic's difficult, I go to my office and I work till late. Um, so the land I know is where I go from where I park my car to where I go into work. And being able to have folks maybe take their lunch time to see how incredibly dynamic and rich um, the landscape is and the history woven into the land has been very exciting. And as I said, a huge asset to the city itself is how walkable it is. So I don't know of another downtown where the river is so well preserved for walkability. Um, you know, you really can access that path from so many parts of the city. And and um, one of the things that delighted me the most is you can go from a big, busy sort of office space to the park that where the herons nest and be in this completely quiet, sort of enchanting space. Um, so that's so unique um, and so special. And I think poetry is a great way to notice that because you can take it in a lunch break. You know, you can take it small and start to observe and see what an incredibly special place this is. I also wanted to be respectful of each person. So when you say the word poetry, people have different reactions. Sometimes folks get very excited, but sometimes it can feel a little off-putting. They're immediately taken back to, you know, ninth grade literature and composition. <laughs> um, so I created a lot of opportunities for people to begin from a place of curiosity. So to start from maybe a question or start from a species or a type of tree that they might be able to see and use poetry to get a little deeper. Of course, my learning was also very profound in this space. So had I never had this chance to be in the laureateship position, I wouldn't have known about these tiny patches of old growth that remain sort of nestled in the ravines. Um, I wouldn't have known very much about the kokanee salmon. I wouldn't have known about the incredible efforts being made to restore creeks, um, to count and incubate kokanee so that they come back and are preserved as part of this landscape, which I think think is one of the most incredible and heroic acts being undertaken um, by hard workers in the city today. Um, if anyone ever gets a chance to see um, areas along Bear Creek or um, even Idlewood Park where the Kokanee Incubator um, is trying really hard to bring back this keystone species and this truly iconic, beautiful little red fish um, that have always been here. It's really incredible to see. Um, so I, I offer gratitude for being able to learn that from the city and also to encourage it in others. One of the things that came to me, um, and it happened early on, so my laureateship began when the pandemic was still pretty um, much impacting our lives, and that's one of the reasons that so much of the work I did was on the ground, where people could come outside and independently or with their families uh, connect to poetry by doing these poetry walks or by responding to prompts. Um, and one of the interesting things that I thought about was how important the landing spaces of Redmond are. So right downtown um, in Luke McRedmond Landing Park um, was one place that it struck me. And I thought critically about it as well. So of course it's a beautiful space, but I thought of it as 
it's an interesting narrative about the story of a very well-frequented um, lake to river and slough system that's been used by tribal people forever, um, but that took on the name of this one person who happened to land there when truly um, canoes have landed through this region since time immemorial. And it stuck in my head as this idea of what is a landing place? You know, really every city is a place that people landed, um, that people found was perhaps a place of shelter, of community, of sustenance, sometimes necessity is where you land. Um, sometimes you land in a harbor because it's the only place your ship can be. Um, and sometimes curiosity is what creates the landing space. So the idea of landings became really important to me as the Poet Laureate, and I wanted folks to think about how their ideas could land in place. Perhaps writing could bring them to a sense of emotional um, balance or emotional curiosity about how, how it feels, maybe to walk to um, Lake Sammamish and notice how your emotions and your senses change. But I also wanted my poetry to encourage people to be curious about the histories of the land, even when the curiosity may bring bring difficult questions about what's here, what stories are emphasized, and what stories are not. Um, I think poetry makes a lot of space for that kind of historical reckoning of how do we, in a dynamic, diverse, multicultural society, tell the story of a community. And one way is to make sure that everybody gets access points or points of landing, where their story and their perspective has a chance to come into the weave of the community itself. So that's part of what I hoped to do. Um, I'm showing a visual now of this installation, um, worked with the same group of young folks um, to do a poetry projection. This was at the downtown park, um, and this particular projection um, had to do with both the kokanee and um, the old growth, so the patches of pre-contact growth. This was part of um, Redmond Lights, and what we hope to do this year is continue um, my project in the laureateship. So hopefully folks who attend um, or get a chance to see Redmond Lights will see this again. And what I'd like to do at this point is I'm gonna read a poem. So part of the laureateship does encourage us as poets to write poems based on this place. And um, so I wanted to acknowledge this very special um, moment through a poem. So I'm gonna I'm gonna grab that. Okay, and here's the backstory of this poem. Um, early on, actually before I became the laureate of the city of Redmond, I was asked to give a keynote for the Parks Department. And um, that's one of the reasons I did that walk, that river walk, because I wanted that land-based context. And it created a wonderful bond, I think, with me and folks in the Parks Department um, that carried through, and I hope will continue to carry through well beyond my time here. And one thing that happened is um, one of the Parks employees contacted me, and he said, you know, I've had this story in my mind, I've had this thing that happened, and I know I wanted to tell someone, and I didn't know who to tell, and he said, um, in the trail, um, and I think it's called the West Side Trail, that goes kind of from like the border of Ren Redmond and Bellevue down the ravine and into Marymore Park, he said, we just had um, uh, an old growth fall. We just had a pre-contact Douglas fir fall. And he said, our forestry department has told us that it was probably about 650 years old. Um, and he said, I just, I just want to tell someone. Um, and he said, maybe you could pass this along to folks from the Snoqualmie tribe, and would you like to come see it? And I said, I very much would. <laughs> um, so this was such a beautiful moment. Um, and I'll add, um, the, the Douglas fir fell, it was more or less, you know, just naturally the end of its life. So it wasn't necessarily like a violent fall. It was, I think, at the end of winter, um, it had just, you know, kind of come off the side of the ravine and was allowed to remain there. So now it kind of functions as a nurse log. And if you want to see it, 
not that easy, to be honest, but um, it is on that west side trail, it's quite steep, um, but if you have some binoculars, uh, you can kind of see its path and you can see some of the other old trees as well. So I wanted to honor this kind of sharing and um, this information in a poem. So this little stanza that you see here um, is part of that poem and that poem became the basis for this projection. Um, and it's kind of like one of my two poems devoted to my tenure here. So I'll read this poem now. It's called The West Side Fir. Lichen dropping from tree branches attest to the purity of the air. Douglas fir in close stands of old growth naturally prune their own lower branches so the crown level starts far above the human gaze. In the city, alongside the walking trail and the once meandering river, a pre-contact fir falls into a net of green. Inside the rings of the tree, the memory of a green mantle that stretched from fresh water to salt. Deep channels in the bark cradle the symbiotic growth of algae, mold, and yeast that make lichen. A fallen tree provides a nest of new growth. Hypothetically, lichen may be an, inter be an eternal organism, forever exchanging form. When the land begins, it begins in lichen and tree fall. Let the city under the moved river breathe in the air of the fallen fir and its gilding of lichen and hear the sounds of its own heartbeat in the currents of the persisting river. So that was, um, I think for me, the iconic experience of Redmond to see this fallen uh, pre-contact Douglas fir next to you know, a beautiful, busy, dynamic park um, full of multi-generational folks you know, enjoying all the things that people do in a park, I thought was a really wonderful metaphor for a place like Redmond. And I latched onto the um, lichen because that's also a fascinating organism that we have plenty of. And a really captivating thing about lichen is they're quite extraordinary. Um, in perfect conditions, uh, scientists hypothesize that they are eternal, that a lichen can go on forever um, because it's fun functionally a symbiotic growth. So lichen are these wonderful, you know, tiny mysteries um, that surround us. And very often it is the lichen layer that makes a, begins to make a place habitable after um, a cataclysmic event. So um, I feel grateful to have had that experience here and also to offer it to the community because often Redmond doesn't seem like a place that has retained any old growth, but tiny little patches remain, um, particularly in the deep ravines that were, you know, not really uh, feasible for loggers to bring trees out of. And to me, it's a reminder that the land really is eternal, um, that something from the past always remains, even in a place as changed as Redmond. Okay, um, and what I'd like to speak to next is um, some of the ways that people can continue to engage with the ecosystem of Redmond to spur creativity, um, to enjoy and notice place. So the first thing I think is important to share is the entirety of Lake Sammamish, which I think is the kind of core beating heart of the city of Redmond um, is, an, is a really iconic and national urban wildlife refuge. So Lake Sammamish is quite unique um, in that it's considered to be one of the nation's only urban wildlife refuges. And I don't know, um, I don't want to be too repetitive, but an important facet of Lake Sammamish as well is how profoundly successful 
its restoration to ecological health has been. Um, when I was very young, um, one of the things that I remember is that Lake Sammamish was badly polluted through industrial waste. In fact, I believe in the era just before I was born, um, it was one of the nation's worst ecological disaster sites, and it was what's called a Superfund site. Um, but the effort to bring it back to um, a place of better ecological health has been fantastically successful, a huge success story in how some of the kind of catastrophe of pollution can be halted through human effort and ingenuity. So I think of the lake as such a beautiful survivor. Um, and there are so many access points to it from Redmond where you can actually see the ecosystem functioning, um, coming back to itself, coming back to a place of health. And as I mentioned, those elements of the ecosystem that continue to suffer, um, I really appreciate the steps that the city are taking to address that. So the kokanee incubators, the um, efforts to revitalize streams and keep them cool is so important. Um, um, it's something I'm so proud of as a, you know, a fellow King County citizen as well. Um, and I hope to elevate that. I hope people can see that right here in our community, um, we have an example of how our desire as people, our efforts and our labor to bring an environment back from the devastation that we as people have wrought upon it can really be successful. Um, so I try to kind of talk about that even on a national stage because sometimes it can feel, um, there can feel a sense of hopelessness in young folks who see environmental kind of catastrophe and see species impacted by human altered landscape. Um, but as we alter, I think we can also heal. So um, that's part of what I hoped to honor in these narrative layers of landscape is to be honest that great mistakes have been made um, in our city, in our region, um, and it becomes our imperative as the storytellers but also as the scientists, as the, the laborers to, um, to correct those mistakes and note that we are part of the ecosystem and completely dependent upon it. Um, without our watershed, we cannot stay here. Uh, so that's been really um, exciting and wonderful and optimistic um, is to be able to hold that space and to see it continue to grow. Um, there's something about seeing the fish restoration in particular that feels really profound and um, it really kind of makes my heart swell to see, you know, a salmon incubator um, bring kokanee back to the streams they've always been in. Okay. All right, so what I'd like to do next is I'm actually going to share um, one of the activities um, that can connect you to place right in the moment, wherever you are. Uh, this is something I've encouraged folks whenever I've had the chance in Redmond to perhaps um, teach a class, is to look for signs of the season so Redmond, you know, we're quite fortunate here in Cascadia. We've got these beautiful, distinct seasons and the most iconic images of seasonality, um, I think, in almost anywhere in the States. Um, and then be attentive to the air around you. So connect to land by seeing the signs of seasonality and then feeling kind of what's the wind doing? How is my breathing in this space? What can I smell in the air? And then that allows an opening space for poetry. Um, I like to share this because I think it shows how a poem can begin just by looking and breathing. Um, and sometimes for folks who maybe are in the middle of a moment of lots of work and lots of kind of hustle, a five minute pause just to see what are the signs of the season? Um, and what, what is the air I'm breathing? What do I notice? Um, can bring you into a place of, I think, significant lyrical curiosity and beauty. So I think that what I ought to do now is um, I'd love to just kind of wrap up with sharing a little bit about how you can engage with my final project and perhaps even share it in your communities. So this um, next image is an example 
of, um, this is when we installed one of the poetic walks. Now, this poetic walk was up at Farrell McWhorter Park, um, and it was really fun to see all the young folks do it. So up at that park, there's a, there's a nature-based preschool. And we had all these adorable little children, and they were kind of hopscotching. And then each of these prompts has something you can see. So um, it's a farm park, so we have like horses, squirrels, um, all the different like elements of the trees and plant life around. And they would hop on it, and then they'd go find it. Um, but the adults were able to hop on it and then go see a prompt. You can see. Um, an installation just like this right now at Idlewood Park and that will remain up for as long as it can stay. So usually these are vinyl stickers and usually they stick down for about six months. So we're hoping that we'll be able to have that installation up through the winter. Um, I'll also be giving out these pamphlets that have all the prompts so that you can take them from kind of from your own home if you'd like. And um, this image shows the second poetry walk, which was all through the downtown corridor based on um, the Sammamish River. And this one allowed folks to kind of participate um, from different stations of the river. So some people walked the whole thing, which was about a mile, and some people just went place to place. All of these can still be found on the city's website. So people can still participate in this, and um, hopefully they will be archived. I'll be asking about that. And this um, goes to show um, last year's Redmond Lights had prompts. They were based on um, plant life, and we, um, collaborated with the Snoqualmie tribe. So you can see this image shows you that um, this signage shows local plant life that was utilized for medicinal food or shelter purposes. And um, if you can see, it offers you the word in up top is Northern Lashutsi, um, and then Southern Lashutsi is right under it. So you can see the pronunciation in Lashutsi as well. Um, and I may have, run just a hair over, um, it's okay. <laughs> but this is the final project that's still up. Um, this is what we think of as the Lake Sammamish project. Um, currents, currents of connection, which connects different forms of the ecosystem with the Kokanee salmon right at center. And this project is much larger in scale thanks to um, a fellowship from the American Society of Poets and the Carnegie Foundation. So this will actually include a permanent prompt about the Kokanee um, at Idlewood Park as well. But I'd love to encourage folks to um, grab a flyer. Um, this is the companion piece to this project, and the flyer at is full of prompts and actually includes um, a bunch of different locations. Um, so hopefully wherever you are in Redmond, you could access one. Um, so we included Downtown Park, Bear Creek Trail, the Redmond Trestle, Jewel Community Park, the Watershed Preserve, and of course, Idlewood Beach Park. And um, we worked, again, in connection with the Parks Department to say, where are all of these elements of the ecosystem most present? So, you know, for example, um, the Redmond Trestle is connected to the bald eagle because usually you can see one there. Usually there's, there's a couple big nests. Um, the Douglas fir is connected to the watershed preserve because there's plenty of them there. And the black bear is connected to Jewel Community Park because they tend to catch them on the trail cameras there every so often. So please do um, take a brochure before you leave. Um, take as many as you like. I brought a good stack. Um, and if you are inclined to write a poem, um, my next role or my current kind of role going alongside this is I'm King County's poet planner for the next two years. And what that's connected to is what used to be called poetry on buses, which has always had a big presence in Redmond, right? Often they bring the bus to um, when we used to do poets in the park. And fingers crossed, we'll do it again. Um, so this is now kind of poetry in public, which embraces poetry on all transit. And we are calling for um, poems based on the theme Places of Landing, which I kind of really came from my time here. Um, the creation of that theme, I connect deeply to my time in Redmond. And I'm going to have these little um, 
bookmarks where you can scan um, to submit a poem. And I'd love to warmly encourage folks to submit poems um, so that they might appear, could be on a bus, could be a light rail, um, could be sound transit. We're even hoping that we'll have poems appear on the passenger ferries um, in and around Seattle and the buses that go out to the trailheads. Um, so I want to encourage that kind of as my closing remark. and give you my appreciation. You've been a wonderful audience. I know that I, I've been looking forward to kind of this as an act of closure and gratitude to how much I've learned from the community and how much I've come to appreciate and love my place in the ecosystem here. All right, thank you.